about today flows on a bit from uh, last night. I want to try and begin to navigate the welfare state. And in order to um, navigate the welfare state, we have to understand one kind of central model. So there's one model which most people working on comparative welfare states use. It's a model that uh, um, Goster, Esping, Anderson has developed. So we've got this model. I want to talk about that, introduce the model. I then want to talk about the criticisms of that model, what people have criticised. One really big criticism is it misses out the global south. So Peru, Latin America, all of these other countries aren't considered in, the, in this model until about uh, 2000. And from the last 15, 16 years, people have started to look at the Global South and consider it in the, um, in the bigger model. And then I just want to come back to the conclusions, because again, working from um, last night, I want to say in some ways, Latin America and Australasia share something. They share something because they both complicate the models. They compl complicate them in different ways, but if you like, they're difficult for the model to, um, to take on board. So there's, there is, in some ways, a good reason for looking at Australasia and um, Latin America. So when we're talking about the welfare state, what do we mean by welfare state? And uh, you know, the usual definition is that it's a concept of government. Um, in which the state plays a major part in the protection of the economic and social well-being of its citizens. So it's made up of a number of aspects. It's about equality of opportunity. It's about equitable distribution of wealth. And it's also about public responsibility for those who aren't able to ensure you know, the um, minimum provisions for a good life. Now that kind of definition involves measurement and metrics at every level. What do we say is a minimum requirement for a good life? And how do we measure that? And how do we compare different countries in terms of that? And how do we measure what the state's doing? Because it's not as simple as that. We can't just measure spending. I'm going to come to this in a minute. It's much more complex. You can't just measure what the state spends in terms of pensions. Because the state does many other things as well, such as education, such as your university here, San Marcos. So um, what I want to do is I pick that a bit. Because above all, when you do comparative welfare history, you're covering a whole range of economic and social organisations. And it's very hard to compare them, especially when the foundation of the whole idea rests on concepts which are Western, uh, uh, concepts of the North. So um, uh, T.H. Marshall described the modern welfare state as a distinctive combination of democracy, welfare, and capitalism. And many countries have a very different mix of those three components. They might have authoritarian government. They may have indirect welfare. They may have um, a very, um, uh, if you like, uh, non-successful um, capitalism. So it's a definition, looks as if it's pretty easy to be working with, but it's full of issues and difficulties in terms of measuring. So the welfare state um, has uh, comparisons are resting on this concept of welfare regimes. There are different welfare regimes in the world. And to begin with, they simply measured how much the state paid. So it was a simple measure on spending. How much did the state pay in terms of um, welfare? And in 1958, Walensky um, and Lebeau started to look at kinds of welfare regimes instead of just one. So instead of just having one linear welfare state that you compare all countries to, 
they said so that they're different kinds and they introduced the, ki the concepts, a residue and institutional choice. So a residue is a very rudimentary kind of welfare state in which it's just a backstop. It's just to help the people who are most vulnerable in society. And an institutional choice involves the state doing a whole range of things. It can do pensions, it can do education, it can do health. So a whole range of, um, of facility. Richard Titmus in 1974 introduced a third kind of um, concept. So he used the ideas of um, Walensky and Lebeau, and to that he added the kinds of um, uh, residue. It was simply um, someone, if you like, a backstop if someone's not doing very well. Institution, industrial achievement performance. And so that's about um, giving to those who are meritorious. So it's full of ethical judgments of people in society. It's about moral standards and considering who should get welfare and who should not. So that involves a different kind of um, concept. And the third one, institutional um, res um, um, distributor, is about, in the best case, if you like, universalism. So uh, how widely do we distribute it? Do we give middle class people welfare? Do we give uh, welfare to business? Do we give welfare only to the poor um, in, um, in society? But what Walensky and Lebeau and Titmus were doing was they're saying that there's a policy choice. So it's not just inevitable as a country develops that it takes on responsibilities for doing welfare, but it's, a, it's not just a lineal principle, it's a regime. And it's about choice and politics. So we introduced that kind of, of aspect. And in 1990 was a huge turning point because Gosta, Esping, Anderson developed a, the most complex theory to date. And he analyzed what he called three worlds of welfare. And this has remained the basis of comparison ever since. It's a really important um, uh, model. And in that model, he looks at three kinds of um, principles. He studied 18 countries in the OECD. People know what the OECD is, it's the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. It was established in 1961 to promote economic and social development amongst its members. And so the OECD has wonderful statistics. Um, they measure and analyse what's happening in the countries. There are 36 countries in the OECD at the moment, including um, Mexico and uh, Chile, but not Peru. And um, so he used this material, and he had three kinds of principles. So what he wanted to look at was, um, first, the idea of transferring um, resources from people to others. So redistributing those kinds of sources, social transfers in terms of pensions and benefits and taxation. And secondly, he looked at the purpose for doing that, and that is to redesign the, the society, to look at social stratification, and to try and play around with where people are in the social, um, the social order. And the third thing he looked at that no one had been looking at before was the relationship between private and public. Until uh, F. Sping Anderson's model, most welfare historians had only looked at um, the issue of, um, of, as I say, spending. They hadn't looked at private public, what people do to help each other, corporation, family, and you cannot look at, uh, at welfare without looking at that private public um, domain. So he arrived at an ideal type he said there were three major worlds in the data that he was looking at. So first, there was a welfare state aimed to relieve poverty. 
and that was a um, uh, had quite low rates of taxation, but it had a whole range of social security policies, and it was about reallocation. There were minimum benefits, but they were often means tested. So in order for someone to get the benefits, you had to show that you didn't you had to go to the government and open your books, show what kind of income your family had. So they're what's known as means tested, and often the people who received welfare were stigmatized. It was seen as, because they're poor, as being a bad thing to be receiving um, welfare. So he characterized the countries that had that kind of welfare history into the 1990s when he was analyzing it. And he said that Australia, Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, the UK, and the USA all had the same kind of wealthy state, and therefore it was um, an Anglo-Saxon liberal wealthy state. So that was one kind. The second kind he looked at was what he called a conservative, corporist, Christian democratic state. So corporation, corporist, means that business and workers and the state agree. So it's not oppositional. The trade unions aren't seeking to impose their view or to have industrial action. There's a conversation, a dialogue in society and agreements are come to. Now this kind of wealthy state is, is relatively generous, but it's based on a completely different principle. It's based on insurance. So everybody in the state will pay money into a fund, like insurance, and then everybody that pays into the insurance gets the benefits. And so there's no stigma to, to in fact, it's seen as a, a moral thing, a good thing, that you are looking after yourself by paying social insurance. Um, and, and so he says that the countries that had that kind of principle were Central European states, like Italy, France, Austria, and Germany. So those are the first two worlds, an Anglo-Saxon world, a Central European world, and there was a third um, world that he said was very, very different, and that is the Nordic world. That is a world of social democratic um, investment, and that's where your sense of being looked after has nothing to do with whether you work and you're poor, has nothing to do whether you've paid insurance and so you have a right to receive it, Everybody in society has a right to welfare. So it's known as universal, a universal system. And it has a strong tradition of rights, and your sense of being able to maintain your livelihood has got nothing to do with your ability to work. Everybody in that society should have a minimum income. Sometimes that's described as a basic income. And so there's a big push to have a basic income for everybody, whether they work in paid employment or not. And that's the smallest world, and it's Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. So you have three kinds of worlds, an Anglo-Saxon world, a conservative, corporate world, or you have a Nordic and Scandinavian world. And you can see that this is only looking at a small part of the world in many ways. I mean, probably the um, overhead at the top shows it more clearly. Um, you've got the, the central um, European um, model, you've got the uh, Nordic model, and then you've got this Anglo-Saxon model. Um, and uh, and uh, New Zealand and Australia, this one doesn't include New Zealand, but New Zealand's part, um, part of this too. So it's a global, what's often described as a global North model. It only considers um, the, um, the North. So Carol. Okay. Buenas noches, eh, la profesora, hoy en día de hoy el tema es el bienestar de estados eh, según la tradición de Marshall. El bienestar de estados es un concepto de gobierno, hay que entenderlo de ese lado, que este, juega un papel principal eh, en el rol de proteger y promover eh, económicamente y socialmente el bienestar de todos sus ciudadanos. Está basado en los principios de, de, igual, de igualdad, de oportunidades, 
de distribu eh, igualdad de distribución de riqueza, eh, responsabilidad pública para aquellos que no pueden gozar de las mínimas, de las políticas mínimas para tener una buena vida. Y el tema general es este, cubrir la variedad de formas de una organización social y económica. Eh, todo esto está basado en el sociólogo Marshall, que describía que un estado de bienestar es aquel que, no, que combina distintivamente eh, la democracia, el bienestar y el capitalismo. ¿no? Eh, y dice que muchos de ellos, algunos, este, muchos estados lo, lo tienen indirectamente a veces y hay personas que no, no se ven satisfechas con las mínimas políticas. Eh, eh, welfare... Okay. Eh, ¿Qué, eh, qué régimen de bienestar hay? ¿no? ¿Qué políticas escogió? Eh, está basado en, tres, uh, en dos autores, de Wilinski y Lewis, en el año 1958, que trataba eh, más que todo de, de lo, eh, reci, eh, escoger institucionalmente una línea, enfocarse solo en un, eh, en un principio. ¿No? Y este, lo más importante es que este eh, principio determine el bienestar de un país en particular. Eh, también tenía que estar basado en cómo distribuirse, eh, con Richard Timus, cómo se distribuyen las clases eh, sociales, si le vamos a dar a los ricos o a los pobres. Eh, más que todo trata de la distribución, redistribución eh, institucional de los estados y... Eh, Habla también de, un, de este autor que es este, que es, eh, la profesora se está basando, que es Gosta Spine Anderson, eh, con su libro Los tres eh, mundos del bienestar en el capitalismo. Y tiene, este libro tiene tres ideas principales. Y el primero habla sobre el anglosajón, el, el liberal, el bienestar liberal anglosajón, que lo, eh, buscaba, su único objetivo era eh, enfocado en la pobreza. Esto se dio y se enfocó en los países de Australia, eh, Canadá, eh, Irlanda, y eh, está incluido también Nueva Zelanda, Reino Unido y Estados Unidos. El segundo punto era sobre, eh, lo, hay países eh, basados democráticamente eh, muy conservados, muy conservadores, y que eh, a veces eh, nos, da, nos brindan más beneficios generosos. Eh, basándose en los principios de seguros eh, nos dice que en estos países no está estigmatizado eh, dar un seguro por, eh, y esto se basa en el diálogo en sociedad eh, esto se da en los países de, central, de Europa Central como Italia, Francia, Aust Australia y Alemania el tercer punto es sobre los, eh, el, el nórdico democrático social o el modelo de universalidad, donde todos los puntos están incorporados. ¿no? Eh, el, lo, el, más, el, el más fuerte punto es la tradición de los derechos en sociedad y eh, el sustento, el estar seguros de tener un sustento para poder tener la adquisición. Y esto se da en los países de Suecia, Noriega y Dinamarca. ¿No? Y también la profesora en esta primera parte lo que quiere enfatizar eh, fue eh, tratar de navegar en ese camino de la historia comparativa del bienestar de Estados. Eh, y esto se da en, el, en las políticas sociales del siglo XX. Okay. So, um, Gosta um, is being, uh, Anderson's model is really important. It's important for two main reasons um, because instead of having more or less welfare, that notion just of spending, uh, he considered the systems, the systems which gave rise to the different worlds. And so he's particularly interested in historic, the historic experience of a country and also about the political movements. So what he's doing is he's looking not just at structure, but at agency, at how people within the society can change that kind of shape. And it's, um, uh, secondly, very important because it was paradigmatic. So it gave a benchmark for everyone else who was doing welfare history to compare against. And that 
compares to Marx's suggestions. Uh, a lot of Marx's work on the welfare state says that the welfare states legitimise capitalism, so that the, um, wealth, the uh, welfare is given in a way that's complicit with the nation, and the nation uh, uh, it controls the people that is within society as a, as a consequence. The rational choice or public choices theory suggests that really what's the most important thing in society is on the political realm. And so it's the relationship between politicians and administrators. And that that's what really is the motor to change in, um, in bureaucracy and therefore in um, welfare states. What Epstein Anderson did was to interact all these factors, to bring both of them in and to suggest that there were uh, a range of reasons for outcomes, social outcomes, and they weren't necessarily the same, there's no magic formula, that it's the relationship between these factors. And also a concept called path dependency. That is that there is historical and there are worlds and that you can see why they develop because they have decisions made at one point which lead on to decisions at another time. So it's not just random choice, but that people are impelled because of uh, past circumstances and present circumstances to make certain kinds of um, decisions and certain kinds of um, uh, spending of welfare. So, um, since um, in the wake of three worlds, there's been a lot of work on, um, on developing, testing, adjusting, criticising and applying his topology. So most of the work you pick up on comparative welfare states, you'll see um, S. B. Anderson's model as being the basis on which much of that comparison um, is done. So what about the criticisms um, of this model? So when people have tested and analysed and considered it, what, what, what kind of shortcomings um, come up? And there's a number of um, things that people point to. They point first to geographical bias, so that it only looks at some pathways and not at others. So a whole group of historians and uh, contemporary analysts from the Mediterranean said that the models don't take account of Southern Europe. So countries such as Italy and Greece. And in those countries, you've got clientism, you've also got very traditional family organisation. And families took a lot of responsibility for uh, welfare in amongst their people. So it's not just the public-private, it's the role of the family being so dramatically large in those um, societies. So a Mediterranean um, model was called for. Secondly, there was an Asian model. So a number of Asian historians and Asian commentators said that the model that um, Esping Anderson developed didn't take account of religion, Confucianism, um, in um, Japan and, uh, and other East Asian um, countries, which had welfare policies. They had very minimum welfare policies but they invested very greatly in education. And if you're going to consider welfare, you have to take account of this Asian model which invested so heavily in education and, and, and must take account of it. As an historian myself from um, Australia and New Zealand, um, the area that is left out or not really described well is Australia and New Zealand. So in New Zealand and Australia, you've got social protection. So it's not just that work, um, you know, the people who have um, not much income or are unable to work get welfare. Indeed, the state was very radically involved in structuring the society. And so yesterday I talked about Chris Watson's um, first Labour government. That government um, had an attorney general, um, J.B. Higgins. And J.B. Higgins introduced the first measure of a minimum wage in Australia and New Zealand. So in 1907, he introduced a measure that every male working should earn enough to keep a family of two in frugal comfort. So the state guaranteed, if you like, 
to male workers an income. It's not, a, it's not welfare, it's an opportunity um, to be involved in work, but to earn at a certain kind of rate. To have awards, to have 40 hour weeks, to have holiday pay, to have holidays off. So all of the kinds of structures of the work, the state in Australasia intervened very, very strongly. And it had, in so many ways, a, um, a radical welfare situation. And so um, Frank Castles, in 1985 and 1993, published major works saying that um, uh, there was a particular welfare state and when um, Esping Anderson's work was published, he came in and said um, that model hasn't taken account of New Zealand um, and Australia. Between 1894 and 1916, every state in both New Zealand and Australia at the federal level instituted courts of arbitration and industrial relations courts, which determined wages and the conditions of employment. One of the things they did, in addition to that, was ensure that women did not have equal pay. So under the structuring, women earned by decree only 50% of what a man earned. The notion being that women didn't have families to um, support. Now we know of course there are widows and there are solo mothers, and, but the state said that women in general did not have a family to look after and therefore they will uh, not have equal pay. In addition to this work um, uh, structuring that the state involved itself in, it also introduced very, very early widows' allowances, sole mothers' benefits, family allowances. So the state provided for those groups who weren't defined by the industrial courts um, income and the conditions at which they could, um, they could survive. So that's one kind of criticism, that a whole group of regions did have a very different experience from, um, from what Esping Anderson was saying. Secondly, a whole group of historians, um, led perhaps by Jane Lewis in 1992, looked at uh, women and said that women had been poorly treated in the model. And so she argued that uh, you really needed to take into account um, women. And Marilyn Waring published a book in 19, 1988 called Counting for Nothing. And the major thrust of that kind of feminist analysis is that very few government accounts take account of what women do. And so it doesn't measure the work that a woman will do in the home. It doesn't measure the welfare that families provide. And so she called on a new kind of measure. Now today, there's all kinds of measures about well-being. In the 1980s and 90s, the concern was about adding time use surveys and finding out exactly what women were um, involving and contributing um, to, um, to uh, 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 welfare. And that the model didn't take account also of change over time and what's called defamilization. And so what's happening when families are smaller? What's happening when women go out into paid employment in increasing numbers? What happens when uh, uh, families now have um, several generations to sustain? Um, so what happens when you've got changing family circumstances and that's also unaccounted for in Epsing um, uh, Anderson's model. And the third kind of um, criticism is led by Claire uh, Bambra, and that's looking at those things I've already mentioned, non-cash payments. And so her work, particularly um, uh, in, uh, in uh, um, that published in 2005, her work is looking at health and education and non cash kinds of contributions. So she argues that health is an issue of equality in a welfare state. That issues about life expectancy, infant mortality, diet, obesity, that these are often class structured 
structured by different groups who have different access to that. And it's one of the things that the state and its welfare needs to take into account, and the model, um, the model uh, doesn't. So we've got a range of, um, of criticisms about um, Epstein um, uh, Anderson's um, model. One of my favourites, of course, is that Titmus, we mentioned before Richard Titmus, his book in 1974. His own daughter went on to become an academic. And Anne Oakley wrote about how her father's model had not taken account of family circumstances. She used her own family, Titmus, Catherine, um, Kay, sorry, Kay Titmus, um, Richard's wife and Anne's mother were all involved in writing about welfare and uh, Anne Oakley had a real go at, the, um, at her mother and father about not just the circumstances of the family home but what kind of model um, they, were, um, they were relying on. So Epstein Anderson's work was published in 1990 and is virtually a research industry based on uh, looking at it and criticising it. So at this point, uh, Caramana. Okay. El siguiente punto sobre las críticas al modelo del norte global, el régimen bienestar de, del autor que presentó, ¿no? que era eh, Spin Anderson. El, hay tres puntos. El primero es sobre eh, la, geogra la geogra geográficamente seleccionada. Es, había gente incómoda. Con, geográficamente había, había negligencias que algunos... Eh, Eh, algunos grupos no se veían representados en este modelo. Por ejemplo, el grupo de había un autor que representa a este a este punto que hablaba sobre el caso and Nietzsche de Elsworden y este autor eh, quería que la pobreza y la igualdad eh, sean perseguidas bajo un mismo bajo mismos instrumentos de redistribución y no estén solamente enfocados en un, en un solo grupo. El punto 2 era sobre la sobre el poder de la mujer que en los años 1990-92 con Jane Lewis se, se vieron representadas. Eh, el caso de la mujer fue no se veían representadas y se veían afectadas más bien por, porque se asumía que el, el hombre el el género neutral del sistema era el hombre, ¿no? Y había una incomodidad, un, todo un... Eh, el rol de la mujer fue importante también para la familia, para el bienestar de la familia, ya que no consideraban, no la consideraban como parte de esta, de la estratificación social. El, un, un gran ejemplo de este, de este movimiento de la mujer es Jane Lewis, en 1990, eh, que enfatiza... Eh, un rol crucial para dar el soporte de bienestar a las mujeres. Y también eh, la profesora indica que no hubo mucha investigación o mucho trabajo sobre el tema de, eh, de qué pasa si una familia ya eh, se vuelve más pequeña, ya que la mujer no, este, no se ve involucrada en esto, toma otros roles. No, no hay muchos eh, trabajos de investigación sobre esto. El tercer punto es sobre la distribución del de la salud, de la educación, que había muchas críticas sobre esto porque no... Clara Pambra, una autora, eh, critica mucho porque este sistema de, de Spining Anderson no miraba lo que era el cuidado de la salud, la expectativa de la vida, eh, la mortalidad de niños, eh, la salud que tiene que ver con la obesidad, la dieta, eh, el fumar, ¿No? Y como estos grupos que no se ven representados por este sistema, mujeres, inmigrantes, eh, madres solteras, eh, estaban en desacuerdo. ¿no? En el año... Eh, entonces, estos, estos son las críticas eh, que se dio. Ah, también hay Richard Timus, de Richard Timus, yes. eh, que también criticaba, ¿no? En el, y también hicieron, este, su propia hija lo criticó Okay, the second um, part is looking at um, one of the major um, neglects or uh, problems with the model that S. B. Anderson developed was it missed out 
most of the world. Um, and it missed out, um, particularly the global south. And work has emerged, um, English speaking work, uh, English, uh, work in English, has been um, emerging after about 2000. And so this work starting to look at what you do about the global south. Where do uh, uh, countries that haven't been included um, fit? Move beyond the OECD and collect statistics and, um, and social spending figures of countries that um, are outside, and particularly um, Latin America. But it's not just a case of adding Latin America and mixing. It requires um, uh, new kinds of um, discussions and, and, to some extent, new kinds of, um, of uh, models. Because there are some countries in Latin America, of course, that have um, welfare provisions very early. Um, Argentina and Chile have uh, welfare programs that were instituted um, relatively um, uh, early in the 20th century. Moreover, there's um, a whole great variety, and that's the issue with uh, what people are saying, with looking at um, the rest of the world. You've got, it's too complex. You're going to have all these kinds of countries. You see Peru on a kind of, if you look at social progress, you know, uh, you're going to look at social spending, you're going to look at social progress. Are you going to look at issues to do with poverty? Uh, how are you going to measure, and how, because we have this model that's really quite precise and looked at particular metrics, how are you going to actually look at the, um, at the uh, Latin America? In the West, you know, we can look at something like France. 31% of the GDP in France is spent on social welfare. In New Zealand and Australia, it's something like 21%. But if you're dealing with countries which have an emphasis on um, uh, non-cash contributions, such as education or health, or they don't have any of that, but include um, very high rates of familial welfare, organising uh, welfare um, around families, then how are you going to uh, measure that and put that um, into, the, um, into the mix? So countries like Argentina and Brazil have relatively high proportions of GDP used on welfare, but Peru and um, Mexico and countries like that do not have that kind of um, that kind of mix. And what most of the work, and I've got a number of pieces of writing there that if you're interested to look at them, particularly um, work like um, WEAR, argue that it's, it is um, very difficult to um, develop models, but they have begun. So for instance, um, um, you've got there uh, uh, Franzoni. Franzoni says there are three models in the global south. So she wants to develop three kinds of world, but a bit like um, Epstein um, Anderson. She argues that uh, countries like um, Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica and Uruguay are industrialised and they have um, an industrial model and it's a pitched at a, a if you like a lower level than much of Esteem Anderson's, but it's a welfare programmed um, kind of model. And secondly, you have a low spending model um, with not much external flows and not much um, remittance, but you've got countries like Colombia, Peru, um, Ecuador, um, I guess Venezuela is now um, uh, changing its, um, its circumstances. And then thirdly, you have a model with indeed um, very little um, uh, uh, cash programs, very little um, uh, contribution to schooling or health, countries like Nicaragua, um, Honduras, Bolivia, um, and so forth. So she has a model, um, if you like, a different kind of world um, in which there are uh, a whole group of other ways in which you can divide um, Latin American countries. Some of these models are two, three, 
for, so we're starting to get from 2000 a whole range of models and they're measured against Epson Anderson. So that is the benchmark by which they're being um, measured. So Caroline? Okay. Uh, in the case of now of the South, in the world of the South, there are certain critics also. Uh, Por, su, por supuesto, ese trabajo estuvo concentrado en el avance de, de los estados de bienestar, pero ¿acaso el sur era diferente a lo que ya explicamos que era el norte? Y la profesora indica que, que sí, ¿no? que hay, hubo muchos esfuerzos enfocados en la presión de desarrollar el modelo de Spin Anderson, del autor Spin Anderson, en, es, en, en, este, en esta parte del mundo, con sus categorías y tipos. Hubo bastante presión, hubo mucha presión. Pero no solo era transferir los conceptos claves a Latinoamérica, no solo era este, to, eh, transferirlos, sino desarrollar un, 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 bien, un sistema de bienestar, unas políticas de, modernas de bienestar, unas estructuras que, que se, sí se desarrollaron en los países como la, eh, Argentina, Brasil, Chile, Cuba y Uruguay, iniciando el, el siglo XX, eh, tal vez al mismo tiempo que los países de Europa. Pero hubo países eh, como, por ejemplo, el caso de Argentina y Brasil, que eh, eh, invertía el 40% de todo su presupuesto en dar políticas de bienestar a, a sus ciudadanos. Pero el caso de México y Perú eh, no, no, no se daba. ¿no? Entonces, eh, concuerda con la autora Julia Martínez, que decía que en, la, en, los America, en Latinoamérica, en Latinoamérica las personas está mucho, este, enfatiza más lo que es las relaciones familiares, lo, los derechos en familia, y no está, eh, no hay mucha, no hay frecuentemente, no hay políticas públicas para ellos, ¿no? Entonces, eh, también, pero esta es una misión imposible, esta es una, no es una misión imposible, hay que identificar tres grupos, los categorizó en tres, los países industrializados del sur, que eran Argentina, Brasil, Costa Rica y Uruguay, los otros que eran menos considerados por lo de los continentes menos considerados relativamente por su bajo nivel de un nivel social eh, y que no invertían mucho están este, Chile, Colombia, México, Paraguay, Perú, nosotros y Ecuador ¿no? por otro lado eh, hay países que están menos desarrollados que no tienen un régimen o un sistema de bienestar eh, por programas públicos con inseguridad eh, mucha inseguridad, mecanismos de inseguridad y el sistema de, 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 de educación y sobre todo eh, lo que trata esto, eh, las críticas van a esto, ¿no? que no, no solo era trans, transportar o transferir los conceptos claves de, de, de lo que ya tenía Europa a, a Latinoamérica. So we have all these local patterns and the development of, of a whole range of welfare regimes, both in the north and the global um, south. But there's also, more recently, an attempt to have a new convergence. And that is an idea that the whole of the uh, um, welfare has been affected by transnational factors. And what they're referring to here is neoliberalism. So in the late um, 20th century and early um, 21st century, many regimes have had seismic, if you like, a seismic fracture, a seismic shock by uh, uh, global financial crises. And with that comes cutbacks. And so um, even though there's this notion of worlds, there's an idea that the whole of these worlds are affected by the same kind of um, uh, experiences and perhaps they've all been transformed by neoliberalism. So if you believe in a world, a uh, welfare worlds model, what's your response to that kind of idea of, um, of neoliberalism? And uh, you've got the, um, the um, um, Osinger's work, Trans Transformation of the Wealthy State, which is a wonderful response to this kind of um, strong globalism and neo-convergence. Um, and what they've done is they've looked at four countries in particular in the um, period from the late 1990s through to um, uh, when that was published 
um, and looking at how have they dealt with neoliberalism. So they find that countries like New Zealand and Australia did have huge financial um, stress. But unlike many of the neoliberal models, they actually refurbished the welfare state at the end of the 20th century. So um, New Zealand introduced what's known as accident compensation. And so it's a form of social insurance. You pay into a fund. And if you have any accident, whether you're a woman in the home, if you're a woman at work, if you're a man at sport, um, a man at work, or any of those kinds of combinations, and you injure yourself, then you can get compensation from the state. Um, it's not having to be work, it can be um, a leisure activity, it can be a, um, a woman paying netball on the weekend. Australia refurbished its welfare state against the current of neoliberalism by compulsory superannuation. And so in 1992, Australia introduced compulsory superannuation. And it now has per capita one of the, the largest superannuation fund um, in the world. And so it's not just a case of welfare worlds being fractured. What you've got there is dynamism. You've got small states refurbishing welfare states and taking them in new directions, crossing over the borders, having hybrid development, and developing their kinds of um, welfare states. And also, it also looks at um, Denmark, um, in which case, um, despite neoliberalism, they argue that um, the social democratic um, policies in Denmark have continued unabated. They've also looked at Switzerland, which is a very interesting example, and they argue that Switzerland went from um, a liberal model, even though it's in the middle of um, Europe, it went from um, um, a liberal model to a much more conservative model. So they're showing that there were a range of responses, a diversity of responses to neoliberalism. It's not just a transnational um, effect on, uh, on global welfare states. But secondly, it's a really huge response to, um, uh, if you like, um, convergence, the notion that all states will respond in the same way to um, issues particularly um, to do with um, economic um, situations. So, most of the work now is moved away from um, S.B. Anderson's model and much more to uh, Frank Castle's and others' work looking at clusters, families of nations, and so looking at countries which are developing the same way um, and they may have different histories, but because of um, structural or indeed um, political issues, they're now moving in different worlds. And they don't have to be in the, some in the global south are moving in ways um, that are in the, if you like, in the, um, in the global um, world. So it leads us to the kind of conclusions. Um, we have a model which has been very important and there's been a lot of criticism. We've had a lot of discussion, a lot of um, research, both the antipathy and wage work as well as the estate and the global self upset the Epstein um, Anderson's model. Do we throw it out? Do we, do, we, we, do we say it's no longer useful because of its um, shortcomings? And what many of the, um, much of the work that if you're working in this area will conclude is that this model is extraordinarily still important, that typologies are extremely important. So what you do when you use a typology is you develop an abstraction. And it's a simple, developed abstraction. It doesn't take account of the details, but it gives you a benchmark, it gives you a model with which to compare all of the others. And that if there's one model that's still extraordinarily important, despite all of the criticism, despite perhaps it not even being applicable to most of the world, the Epstein-Anderson model is the core of comparative um, welfare state. Entonces, eh, los regímenes, regímenes de, de bienestar, siempre hubo críticas. Eh, después de Spin Anderson, del autor, eh, sugirió cinco garantías para, para que se desarrolle bien su, su estado de bienestar. 
eh, estuvo, mucho, eh, estuvo relacionado bastante con lo que era eh, la compensación a los trabajadores, eh, compensación a maternidad, a enfermedades, eh, seguro de familia y seguro a los desempleados y personas eh, incapaci con incapacidad o eh, con avanzada de edad. ¿no? Este modelo especialmente convergió acaso con el neoliberalismo, dice. Eh, no, según eh, Margaret Somers, eh, Francis Casos, dice que quiere enfatizar eh, que estamos muy ligados a lo que es culturalmente, a la familia, a la nación, eh, eh, conectados por el lenguaje, por la historia, por la geografía, pero, eh, pero no solo es eso, sino eh, promover estas políticas para generar un bienestar común de todos. Entonces, eh, hubo transformaciones eh, a, lo, a lo que era el bienestar de Estado y en países como Nueva Zelanda, Su Suiza, eh, se promovió lo que era, eh, más que, eh, fue muy relevante lo que fue la conversación de accidentes de tránsito, por ejemplo, que la profesora dice que hubo, este, podía haber accidentes eh, con tu esposa en el tráfico, de tránsito, y pero tú recibías una compensación. ¿no? Esto era lo que era el periodo neoliberal de esta época. Hubo un cambio. Eh, como en Suiza del liberal se, se pasó a un estado de bienestar conservativo, conservador. Eh, en conclusión, eh, lo que la, eh, la profesora indica es que en tanto Francis Caso, el autor Francis Caso que habla sobre la ganancia y el salario, que se enfatiza más en lo económico, en el lado económico, y el lado del sur, eh, está en desacuerdo con, con el autor que la profesora presenta, que es Spin Anderson, con la tipología, con las características que Spin Anderson presenta. Y siempre ha habido un solo modelo, pero este modelo siempre ha presentado críticas, ha habido discusiones en torno a esto. Pero eh, es importante enfatizar este modelo porque ya, ya que está internalizado en cada uno de, este, de sus ciudadanos y ese modelo va a perdurar si es que eh, cada uno, cada estado, eh, cada estado eh, continúa con las críticas, no, este, no, no se prevé que dejen de haber críticas porque siempre las va a haber. Entonces... Por otro lado, Anderson coincide que el régimen de bienestar tiene que estar muy eh, conectado o de lado en mirar un, un modelo general, no mirar un modelo que dé solución a cada uno de los problemas o características, eh, pro, eh, detalles, detalles, características de varios programas sociales, sino que este modelo en general pueda dar respuesta a todos, no de una manera eh, caracterizada, sino de una manera general. Eh, an historian used the no, archive, no? Yes. archive. Uh, in your research, for example, uh, the politics, not only the state, no? this is a um, uh, connection with the social scene, no? The, no? the urban population, because in the rural society, uh, the welfare state is a phenomenon the modern society, you know, the urban society. Who is the connection between the common population, the middle class, the low class, with the states? You know? Because the politics not only the idea of the state, you know? it's a conclusion between the society and the state. You know? In your research, who developed this? I'm, I'm looking in my own research, particularly at um, the family of nation between um, Britain, uh, Australia and New Zealand. And the archives are not just about high politics. So when I go to the archives um, in London, um, for instance, I will find a whole group of, um, of material um, produced by um, uh, people who went into the settlements. So at the end of the 19th century, there was a huge movement of Oxford and Cambridge um, uh, graduates to go into um, the East End and to poor parts of London and Manchester and other cities. 
and to work with the people and to develop statistics. So Beveridge, who was the often described as the father of the Mel father of the um, of the modern welfare state, he was one of these researchers. He worked with um, Sydney and Beatrice Webb, and you've got a whole group of Fabians and a whole group of social scientists who are starting to uh, develop, um, before the state does, a whole range of um, social statistics because they want to fight for kinds of um, reforms and new kinds of um, ways of doing them. So you might think the archives, if you, you know, if, as an historian, um, you know, we, we, we study in the wake of von Ronka. So Leopold von Ronka was a German historian who uh, was very, um, um, he opened the archives to uh, histories, he wrote in a national history way. And so much of that is about high politics, emperors and uh, kings, and he himself wrote, you know, volumes on um, the popes. But the archives um, have within them a whole range of um, other sources. Um, I don't know what they're like for um, other countries, but the archives I look at in New Zealand, Australia and um, Britain have a range of um, material which picks up on, uh, on people that are, um, if you like, um, uh, less famous, less significant um, uh, in society. Okay. Eh, el profesor le preguntó sobre, sobre este, qué política se desarrolla en un estado de bienestar, no solo, porque no solo se tiene que entender un estado de bienestar en la nación, ¿verdad? Eh, sino con... Eh, con, el, con la población eh, entonces eh, la profesora si tiene algún estudio alguna investigación sobre este tema eh, si sí dice que ha encontrado muchos materiales eh, ha investigado hay estadísticas so, y estudios que quieren dar solución a estos problemas sociales eh, a través de la historia nacional se busca crear políticas para satisfacer a ambos lados eh, y se está continuando ¿no? mirando materiales de otros países como Nueva Zelanda y otros que mencionó y está en continuo todavía este desarrollo estos, este, estas investigaciones. And in addition, the um, welfare state um, or if you like state archives take account of a lot of vulnerable people. Again, I'm not sure about um, places I, I, I research mostly in um, Britain and Australia and New Zealand. And our archives are full of material particularly to do with down and out people, people who are um, very vulnerable. So Australia has a great deal of material on convicts um, because they surveilled convicts and the archives have amazing sources on, on, on them. The archives has amazing sources on indigenous people. So uh, indigenous Australian Aborigines and Māori in New Zealand. The state um, took a particular interest, it was about control, but for a 21st century historian, these records are um, very, very valuable. And so um, uh, the state have um, incarcerated, so um, crime material um, also picks up on the living conditions and the, the re not just the ideal, but the lived circumstances of many people who are on the margins, who, who, are, who are finding it hard to um, uh, economically survive. And so it requires reading across the grain, but there's um, a huge material on people who are, um, who are in need of um, social welfare policies. Para resumir, hay muchas personas que necesitan estas políticas de bienestar, eh, de bienestar. Eh, hay muchas personas que eh, tienen, viven en estas circunstancias de, económicas eh, con, en condiciones de vida muy deplorable y este es el, el, el estado de bienestar busca dar solución a esto, ¿no? Eh, menciona el caso de Australia donde hay muchos este, trabajo, hay un trabajo bien, muy valioso y que se está trabajando en Australia, ¿no? And, you know, um, I'm, I'm a general editor at the Australian Dictionary of Biography. And uh, unlike any other, dictionary pro any other dictionary project in the world, we have a charter to look at significant and representative Australians. And so um, there's been a real um, interest in looking at, for instance, um, women 
and the Australian Digital Biography has one of the highest numbers of um, uh, accounts of women of any digital project. So um, the archives are there um, and the material for looking at um, uh, both the need um, or the, the real lived circumstances of people but also um, the state's activities are, um, are there. En Australia hay un gran número eh, de mujeres eh, y se busca la representatividad de, de esta, ¿no? del grupo de mujeres y hay una idea no solo de satisfacer las necesidades de este grupo, sino también necesidades del Estado. in order to 
uh, obtain Lo que explica la profesora es que el, el gobierno, por ejemplo en el caso de Perú, ¿no? usa esta idea de bienestar común para conseguir, se puede decir a través de beneficios sociales, eh, la popularidad, ¿no? el populismo, lo que se llama el populismo. Entitlements that people don't take up. 
You know, so um, most of the estimates suggest there's something like 10% of people are entitled to uh, programs, to welfare, and they don't take it up for one reason or another. So on one side you may have abuse, but you've also got people who, are, um, who decide they don't wish to have that kind of um, um, support from the state or directly or indirectly. Uruguay es bien temprano, por 
tema obrero y casas de obreros que lleva un cambio de la arquitectura, del diseño urbano. Aquí en Lima tenemos casas de obreros desde antes de la crisis del año 29. Entonces, el welfare state eh, iría en contra de una idea muy generalizada pensando que eso está atento a lo que no te produce y lo repite y lo reproduce. Eso, en el caso del welfare state, no ocurre. Ahora, el welfare state clásicamente se vincula a Inglaterra, que es el mundo anglosajón. O sea, hay varias tradiciones dentro de este proceso, una es la escandinava, otra es la anglosajona, otra es la continental, y dentro del mundo anglosajón uno ve la experiencia americana, que a pesar que Gran Bretaña y Norteamérica tienen muchos vínculos, la británica se diferencia de la, de la americana, y dentro del mundo británico, por ejemplo, Singapur es parte del mundo británico, lo que sido colonial, pero su sistema es muy eficiente, que contrasta con Norteamérica, que tienen pues este, un déficit constante y grandes problemas de organización. Entonces, eh, pensar en welfare state, diríamos, no solo es una política del Estado, sino es tener en cuenta que está en relación con que los sectores laborales, trabajadores, plantean demanda y lo que la clase media, la clase media urbana, piensa que es el nivel de vida que se debe requerir y establecer. Eh, bueno, eh, hay una biografía bastante importante en el anglosajón de la este, pero diríamos que en el contexto actual de la gran migración que afecta a Europa, los migrantes que van a Escandinavia tienen otra relación con el lugar este que los propios suecos son nuevos. Es de ahí que su sistema eh, se piensa que va a progresar en poco tiempo por la gran migración asiática y africana que recién, que no tienen la misma relación con los servicios que los locales. Entonces, este, por eso ¿no? la idea del sur que el asistencialismo es dañino para el propio sistema, una sociedad más urbana, con tradiciones de ciudadanía, hace que el sistema sea más continuo, ¿no? más duradero. Eh, ¿Tienen algún interrogante, alguna pregunta? Sí, Ernesto. Um, 
um, the support given for, for women going out to work, um, the support given for families to have houses, the support given for people to have health, the support given for people to have education. So it's not, it, it's a very, it's a very broad definition of what the sort of activities the state do, does, to ensure um, well-being in its um, citizenship. Okay, eh, no es un estado de bienestar, sino lo que ella es, es habla es sobre un régimen de bienestar que puede hablar de, de, de del dinero efectivo que se maneja, las transferencias, pensiones, educación, salud. Pero no solo son esas políticas, sino también tiene que ver con la cultura del propio este país que posibilita este tipo de régimen, ¿no? Y es un no es, es un, no es una división este, caracter, este, estrictamente eh, caracterizada puntual, sino es una división que tiene que ver mucho con la estructura, que so, tiene mucho soporte en lo que es para la casa, el trabajo, la familia, y es una, una definición muy grande para, para este régimen de bienestar. Eh, la otra pregunta fue sobre... Ella está comparando me parece interesante lo que presté en la región Sajona y la región Escandinava pero creo que la lleva a poder compararlo con los países como he mencionado Costa Rica, Brasil, Argentina, Uruguay en los cuales a pesar de la explicación que hizo el profesor Abandonado lo que uno ve ahí no es una tradición cultural que se dice ¿Por qué Welfare Regime in uh, New Zealand, New Zealand, no, Nueva Zelanda, ¿verdad? In New Zealand, in the, the other countries of so, uh, North America, uh, with, how do you connect with South America? How, why do you say that here in, in South America in the, uh, we have a welfare regime? Because you know, what is the thing that is not a welfare regime, it's just a traditional cultural uh, habits, the assistantialism. Oh, oh. I, I don't know enough about South America. Mm -hmm. um, indeed, that's you know one of the reasons. Um, uh, um, concerned. But but um, um, do you, does he does he not think that this is a welfare regime? It doesn't think it's a welfare regime. They, they don't. Uh, he just uh, don't think that it's a welfare uh, regime. It's just a assistant, assistantialism help help that uh, the government want to help us. Uh, because of our cultural tradition, right. because of health. We, we are uh, traditional, traditionally uh, in order to help others. It's not only a way for it. Um, I think it's nobody in the country who is um, No, he just mentioned that. Why do you compare? Uh, why do you compare both? I don't really. <laughs> I, do, I don't really. I mean, I'm looking at the welfare models, um, and um, and I have not done the research. I'm looking at what um, the Global South research is publishing on it. So um, uh, I take your point, um, but uh, and it may be aspirational. It may be um, uh, to some extent. Um, uh, 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 picking up on what um, uh, small movements there are in order to engage with the conversation. Um, so, uh, no, I haven't done I haven't done research myself. No es una investigación de la propia profesora. Se ha basado en investigaciones y publicaciones, modelos de régimen de bienestar de estos países. Sus publicaciones son más del norte. Y lo que me dice también es que ella no trata de comparar de comparar el norte con el sur, sino establecer un modelo, un modelo de bienestar eh, general, como se podría decir. Y no está muy informada si aquí se, se vive un, un bienestar, una política de bienestar no está tan en tanto, si aquí en estos países, eh, ya que le mencioné que es una tradición cultural, como usted opina, toma ese punto, dice, pero no está tan al, al tanto si, si se, para compararlo. ¿no? Yo creo que para los alumnos, eh, el welfare state es un producto de una sociedad urbana, industrial, y la medida que América Latina no es una sociedad urbana, y menos industrial, entonces, pero sí hay políticas de educación y salud este, en la literatura, en la ciencia política, en la sociología, en la ciencia política, en la ciencia de la la experiencia latinoamericana, pensando en este británica que es el modelo de las minutas clásicas de Wolfram State, que hay antecedentes del siglo XIX, pero cuando hablan de Wolfram State es después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial en el Gran Bretaña, cuando se habla del sistema nacional de salud, el salario 
salud focalizada más bien, no tanto de la población que también está, sino de impedir que las epidemias lleguen hacia los centros y de recargo. Just mean uh, you know talk about a continuum, and so um, um, I take the point about um, Peru, which I don't know um, much about. Um, uh, Brazil seems to be more of a you know although it's a now financial you know not not as not as um, uh, um, clear as it has been in the past, um, but there's a continuum. And that the global south is not off that continuum; it's part of the of the continuum. Es un devenir, una continuidad del del sistema. Menciona que de Perú no sé si se ha dado, pero en Brasil, por ejemplo, antes sí. Pero debido a este venir, a este desarrollo, se va a seguir cambiando. Hay varios cambios.